So displaying an unlimited number of models and configuration. Then in the middle, you can see we have the lifestyle store, like the Renault Atelier in Paris or the Lexus Intersect in Tokyo. And here it's all about inviting people, inviting your customers to subtly experience your brand in a social setting. It could be a cafe, it could be a restaurant, basically a place of social gathering. And then we have the pop-up stores, and these are the most ephemeral of all formats. They're here one day and they're gone the next, but always focused on high footfall areas centered around special events, like a sport tournament, a concert, or a special time of the year. It could be Diwali, for example. In December 2018, Mercedes-Benz opened for one day a pop-up dealership inside a mall where children were the main customers. And if any of the kids fell in love with the car display, parents were able to purchase it, but only online. Which brings me to the next slide and the next important channel, online retailing. Now, digitization is reshaping the way we buy and the way we service vehicles. We at Frost & Sullivan predict that revenues generated by online vehicle retail after sales and service will grow from about 120 billion today to over 605 billion by 2025. 95% of the revenues generated worldwide will come from Europe, America and China half of which will be generated by online retail of new vehicles, whilst the online use vehicle market, driven by online marketplaces, is expected to triple by 2025, with Europe as the biggest market. In the parts and accessories business, global revenues are expected to reach about 78 billion, and online service revenue generation close to 4 billion, driven mainly by parts e-retailers and service aggregators. Next slide. In the terms of units, vehicle sold, it means that online retailing of new vehicles will grow to over 6 million units by 2025. <coughs> Europe has seen the biggest number of OEM initiated online sales platforms, even more now, as we'll discuss during COVID. In China, we can see mainly locally grown platforms that will continue to drive online retail of vehicles with Alibaba's e-commerce platform leading the pack. So to just give you an idea about the numbers and the potential of online and digital retailing, on Singles Day in 2016, Alibaba's Taobao and Tmall platforms, it's like Amazon or Noon, sold 100,000 cars online within 24 hours. Moving on to the customer journey, as mentioned by Mr. Malotra, um, over, can you change, thank you, over the decades um, in retail, we moved from a pure bricks channel, like the brick and mortar store, into pure clicks channel, pure online retail. But what we're seeing now more and more is really the merge of these channels, creating the bricks and the clicks retailing environment. Now, courtesy COVID, all of a sudden, digitization in retail has become a reality. You will have witnessed a drop of 80 to 100% physical visits to your showrooms. I'm not sure if you know the stat saying that we are now down to 1.7 physical dealership visits before a car is bought. Well, right now in COVID, we are at zero visits. And it is really anticipated that even after the lockdown is lifted, Many buyers, many of us, will expect the option of some sort of contactless transaction. Unfortunately, as of now worldwide, less than 50% of dealers are able to offer a vehicle sale completed online or over the phone with a home delivery. And before COVID, this did not necessarily mean the death of the dealership. But all of a sudden, we really have seen a proliferation of out-of-the-box solutions, new solutions thought about to bridge this gap. In response to the social distancing and lockdown, Seat and Skoda dealers, for example, in the UK, have started offering live online guided tours and demonstrations. You know where from? From their home, from their driveway. Dealers display cars at home. And in the first month of operation, Skoda UK delivered 2,000 hours of video product demonstration by dealers from home. And a team of six at SEAT handled over 200 calls of inquiries from customers in just one working week. 
Another example is two weeks ago, Group Renault launched an online retail platform offering virtual showroom tours and a remote e-signature process. So this, this has been launched by a vehicle manufacturer. But dealers who participate in this initiative receive the full margin and the full finance commission on every one of these sales. And this is without the customer ever having put into the showroom. So clearly, it is possible for OEMs and dealers to find a common ground when it comes to online retail in the future. Moving on to my case study, brief case study of Rocker in the UK. So in the UK, a dealership group that really transformed the way vehicles are bought is called Rocker. So Rocker worked with Hyundai in 2015 and now is the digital storefront of three major brands, Jaguar Land Rover, Ford and Mitsubishi. And the concept is really very, very simple. The stores of Rocker are located in high fruitful area in your shopping mall. So even in stores within a store, so like Ford is selling vehicles within a Next or a Marks and Spencer store. And the concept allows people like you and me to just stroll into a dealership and browse. Maybe we would have never walked into a conventional store because we didn't even think of buying a car. And all of this is aided by product angels, like you know them from the Apple store. So they're hired specifically from outside the automotive industry, from brands like Tommy Hilfiger, Ralph Lauren or Apple. And these product angels are not there to sell. They're there to support the customer experience with the car and they're not paid a commission. But then if the customer decides to purchase the vehicle, this can only be done online, even from within the store. So if we move on to the next slide, so we're looking at how digitization was done online, but really the online user experience and the digital elements of the next generation, how we're used to interact, needs to be brought into the physical retail experience. And this can be done through advanced technologies, AR-enabled iPads that allow customers to explore the powertrain and the hybrid technology, or we have virtual reality goggles that engage for high level of gamification that obviously increases the dwelling time at the dealership or as we know it now the um, configurators that learn from multiple sources of customer data from social data that you leave from the inquiry that you leave and then they build this personalized hyper personalized product offering like we've seen it from audi and finally, my last slide is around digital key performance indicators. So we have multiple technology investments that are running in parallel. And it's Hello. really important that we are able to monitor and leverage these investments. That is where digital KPIs are becoming more and more important within an organization. Digital KPIs are used to measure the performance of employees and processes. So both existing processes, analog processes, legacy functions need to be measured digitally, but also new functions such as the connected car or online retailing. Everything needs to be monitored to actually see the return on investment of these new parameters. So new KPIs also need to be implemented within the company for the management and the leadership team because if a company embraces digitization and digital transformation it is key to measure the effectiveness of change and strategy at every level from the dealership to the CXO level at the OEM and I'll pass on now to my colleague Koshik Madhavan who will give some concrete example from the Indian reality Perfect. Thank you very much, Yulia, for the wonderful uh, uh, setting the scene. Um, again, thank you very much to Siam and uh, Arunsan for moderating this panel. So I'll spend just a couple of minutes uh, giving a few uh, perspectives on the Indian um, digital retail market and, and a case study to end with. So continuing from where uh, Yulia left, um, obviously some of the areas, you know, as a result of the situation we've had in India due to the slowdown we had in 2019, and coupled with the COVID-19 situation right now, we will see a lot more activity in, in a couple of areas, uh, such as connectivity, um, you know, um, vehicle leasing, digital retail, and 
uh, vehicle service and aftermarket as well. Um, in fact, I had the opportunity to speak with a couple of uh, multi-brand uh, garages in the past couple of weeks who are actually very uh, uh, buoyant about getting uh, 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 enough number of vehicles once the lockdown eases over the next few weeks. So the aftermarket space might be bouncing back much quicker than the OE space in, in, in India. Um, having said that, um, one of the key areas that is likely to see a lot of activity is the pre-owned vehicle business. Um, um, in 2019, the pre-owned vehicle business was 1.2x the new vehicle business. Um, just last week, uh, there was an article in Economic Times Auto that said the uh, pre-owned vehicle market in India in the recently concluded financial year um, in, in, in March was 40% more than the new vehicle business. So we are already right now at 1.4x. In the next two years, by 2022, it is likely to become 1.8x. That means the pre-owned vehicle business is going to be almost double the new vehicle business. Again, the digitization is playing a big, big role. We've got multi-brand online aggregators. And apart from that, the uh, organized sector is actually expanding. Uh, the informal, smaller, unorganized sector is being taken over by the organized sector, which is helping build the pre-owned vehicle market. Again, driven by digitization. Most importantly, the OEMs themselves are getting into the pre-owned vehicle space. Um, of course, Maruti True Value has been one of the pioneers in the space. Apart from that, you know, Toyota's U Plus, for example, Ford Assure, Hyundai as well. All the OEMs themselves are getting into the pre-owned vehicle space, which is going to give them not only additional business, but also help them drive new model sales, especially in the tier two, tier three, and the rural markets of India. Um, vehicle subscription, again, um, we see that as one of the high growth areas in India. Um, from the Indian uh, market perspective, we see that a lot of the younger customers, the younger generation customers, the millennials, um, are not really interested in the traditional model of purchase and ownership anymore. So they are willing to experiment and which is why the vehicle subscription space is growing significantly. I know we've had Hyundai and Mahindra enter this space in collaboration and partnership with the likes of Rev, Zoom Car, uh, Droom and so on. We see that as one of the key growth areas, especially for the younger generation customers who want to have the experience of owning a vehicle without the hassles of owning one, such as uh, maintenance, insurance, you know, service, spares, everything gets covered as part of the subscription service except fuel. So I think the OEMs will start um, accessing a completely new set of customers driven by digitization um, and, and this is going to be one of the high growth areas for the OEMs in the next 12 to 15 months. Um, just a quick comparison of um, uh, how a traditional showroom um, uh, compares against a digital showroom. You know, Julia clearly spoke about a few examples in, in Europe, uh, with Rocker being one of the most prominent ones. Um, we see that the investment required, both from the real estate perspective and, and, and the cost perspective, is significantly cheaper when compared to a traditional brick and mortar showroom. And, and that is where uh, some of the OEMs today in India, the likes of MG Motor, uh, Hyundai and Mahindra are already experimenting with kiosks, digital kiosks and pop-up stores. Uh, that means the footfall where, you know, um, there is likely to be a higher share of customers walking in to these digital showrooms, um, you know, especially in malls, in highly concentrated areas within the cities, are likely to be ideal targets. So we will see a lot more of these digital showrooms, very small, you know, just about three or four people, um, in comparison to uh, a, a traditional showroom where there are 30, 40 people. Interestingly, um, uh, I was speaking to one of the uh, OEMs uh, early this year in terms of understanding what they look for in a salesperson at a digital kiosk versus a traditional showroom. Um, he told me, we are looking for storytellers. That means it is not just about talking uh, about the product, technology, or features anymore. It is about storytelling, what the brand can do for you. What does the brand represent? I think that is where we are moving towards. It is not just about product-based selling. It is becoming more of brand-based selling. 
Um, I'm going to end uh, with, with, with this uh, particular slide. So this is a case study of nayagadi.com. Um, so this is uh, interestingly the first multi-brand, multi-category retail that has come up in India for the rural market. You know, um, uh, Arun San also spoke about um, how we can take the digital retailing to the rural part of India. I think this is a perfect example. So we have nayagadi.com, which is actually partnering with all the dealerships in their areas. And for one district, their goal is to cover 200 villages. That means, very clearly, they are not even talking about tier 2, tier 3 towns. They are already going to the grassroots level and talking about villages. So today, uh, with nayagadi.com, we have the option of multiple brands on the one hand, multiple uh, um, vehicle segments. That means, with nayagadi.com, you can purchase a four-wheeler, a three-wheeler, a two-wheeler, and even a light commercial vehicle. So it's like a one-stop shop that any customer can walk into and purchase any vehicle segment. Um, one of the KPIs that uh, the founder of nayagadi.com has is by 2025, they want to sell 50% of their volumes coming from electric vehicles. That means very clearly they're already targeting the micro mobility, shared mobility platforms where electric vehicles are going to play a big, big role. So going forward, um, platforms like these are not only likely to proliferate into the rural market in India, but also they are likely to bring together multiple brands, you know, multiple vehicle segments and offer, you know, um, financial services, um, partnerships with banks and banking companies and NBFCs to arrange for loans for customers. So it's going to be a one-stop shop for purchase and for service and aftermarket. So digitization indeed in India is, is um, you know, has, has a great potential. Um, you know, uh, as, as William mentioned and, and gave a global perspective for India as well, going forward, we will see a lot more of these multi-brand platforms uh, emerging, which are going to drive ownership, you know, in the rural market. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand over back to you, Arun San. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Uh, thank you, Julia. Uh, it was good to hear from you that the world is also changing, that in digital space is getting larger and larger. And what you talked about very interesting is the combination of online and offline, which is working very well. And Kaushik, you said it's not only a global phenomena, there's a national phenomena which is visible, whether in the mainstream companies or a standalone companies. One interesting point Kaushik mentioned was the art of storytelling coming up. I always thought storytelling was restricted to Bollywood, Hollywood or Netflix, but it seems storytelling will become a lexicon or a part of the auto industry. Having said that, we now, we want to step back. If you look at the Indian auto industry, you, it's not homogeneous, it's quite heterogeneous because there are three clear segments in the Indian auto industry. One is the two-wheeler, which contributes about 70 to 75% of the total automobile industry. Then is the passenger four-wheelers, and then is the commercial vehicles. There are some commonalities in each of them in the three different segments of the auto industry, but there are a lot of differences also. If you look at the industry, the way it's behaved last year, we had sharp declines in the two-wheeler and passenger four-wheeler of 18%, whereas commercial vehicles did dip by 28%. So I think it'll be a good idea before we jump straight to what needs to be done. We'll go to our panelists and try to find from them what has happened in the last two years, and especially coming from the last two years to the last five weeks, because there's been a titanic, titanic shift there. So what's happening in each of the spaces. To get a perspective of what's happening in the four-wheeler passenger space, I would request Mr. Tarun Gar to share his, his views. Over Thank you, Mr. Mal Thank you, Mr. Malhotra, and good evening, everyone. Good yes, evening. sir, you're right. Uh, uh, you know, as far as the four-wheeler industry is concerned, we are coming out of a very challenging 2019. Uh, of course, the, it was challenging for various towns, uh, the acquisition costs had increased, uh, you know, the insurance costs had increased, the customer sentiment was low, and of course, the biggest of them all was the PS4 to PS6 transition. I think we saw the whole year, there was a lot of confusion in customers, uh, when will the transition happen, this model will happen when, what will be the cost, you know, uh, there were various, various companies coming out with different figures, 
and and do I need to wait for PS six or 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 do I need to buy PS four? So I think um, and of course in between there were some confusions around uh, GST reduction. So uh, what I'm trying to say is it was a very difficult year. Uh, from a dealership perspective, I think dealers are very important stakeholders. Also, it was a very, very difficult year because uh, uh, the, 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 the initial estimate was that the market is going to be very good. So the production was accordingly ramped up. So the stocks were high. Then uh, the, the stress of BS4 to BS6. Plus, of course, the financials suddenly uh, uh, there was a big change because they suddenly found out that uh, when this rotation stopped, many of the dealerships were found wanting in terms of uh, the, the the accurateness of the balance sheets and uh, you know so it was it was really a very challenging year at the same time there were some very positive offshoots also uh, we saw that whenever some new models were launched a very good traction was achieved uh, some new segments uh, came up small MPV came up uh, a very good traction and by the time we had reached March uh, you know there was uh, this speculation about what will happen BS4 to BS6 will there be a fire sale. I think all that ended, and I think uh, as far as the four-wheeler space is concerned, uh, I would say that uh, uh, basically the OEMs were able to manage it very well. Uh, the fire sale never happened, and uh, the industry stock actually reduced to minuscule levels, uh, uh, you know, by the end of March. Uh, so uh, we were actually looking at really a kind of uh, 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 uptick in the industry. Uh, we were very positive now that the BS6 has come in, uh, customers will come back because now there is no confusion. Then many OEMs had also used this opportunity of BS6 to really launch new models. So, uh, so and of course, we were entering the festival season of Gudi Parva and Navratra. So, uh, there were very uh, some positive offshoots. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, of course, the COVID struck. And uh, last four weeks, uh, uh, of course, we all know that the showrooms are closed. Uh, and, uh, of course, the production is off, uh, etc., etc. At the same time, I believe that all of us, uh, we and I'm sure my panelists will agree with me, I think we have done a, a lot of introspection and uh, try to find out look, where do we stand, what can we do. Uh, so many new things have come up. And uh, uh, while, yes, uh, 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 reasons for kind of economy being down and sales being down are plenty, at the same time going forward today, I think I would also like to discuss some of the things which I think we have really found positive and how we can leverage those positives going forward uh, in, in the year and in the post uh, post uh, covid era so i think to start with i'll i'll limit my uh, opening to this thank you thank you tarun what you clearly mentioned was uh, 